So the one way anyway, we'll have several groups. So here is population 1, 2, 3 up till k. The mean and variance for each of those will be hypothesized at least. There'll be mean mu 1, mu 1, mu 2 up till mu k, and the variance is a sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared upon sigma k squared. And here are my k samples. <laughs> That's the first sample, y11, y12. So the first indice here will represent the population and the second observation. So this is the first observation, second up to n1, and the mean is y1 bar. Similarly, for the second uh, second sample, I've got second sample, observation 1, 2 up to n2, and the mean is y2 bar, and so on. So the grand mean is denoted y bar, and this is the mean of all of this. If I average all of those things, I get the grand mean. And the total number of observations in is going to be equal to the sum of the observations in each sample, n1 plus n2, up till nk. So these things are fairly clear. Now, the assumptions of another. Each sample is from a normally distributed population. The samples are independent. And I'm assuming a common variance. So all the variances are the same. This is, you might hear this word, homoscedasticity which essentially means the variances are equal. Now this is exactly the same as for the two independent samples test. So how we check this will be also exactly the same, although we will see some other new techniques over here. So hypothesis, as in the two sample case, we start off by assuming that the means are equal. Now, in the end of the case, because I've got so many means, I can't simply say that mu1 is not equal to mu2 and so on, because all I'm saying is not all the means are equal or simply that h1 is false, h0 is false. Because I could have, for example, that mu1 equals mu2, and then I've got mu3 equals mu4 all the way till mu k. So I've got two groups in the data. These are equal, and these are equal, but they aren't all equal to each other. So this is more complex than just the simple two sample case. So it's simplest to say that, in words, that not all the means are equal, or simply say that H0 is false. The model equation is similar to the two sample case. In fact, it's exactly the same. So, <coughs> excuse me, what I have over here is I've got k populations, 1 up to k, and the observations are y, i, j. So i is population, and j is the observation in that sample. And And so the j's represent the observation number. So each of the populations has a mean mu i, where i is 1 to k. And then there's this is a random error term. So essentially what we're saying is that uh, each observation, I think you must have seen this picture before, essentially arises from some mean. And so the observation over here is just that mean plus some random variation or some random error. E, I, J. And so there's my observation, Y, I, J. So that's the equation model we have. A fixed mean and some random error term. So the alternative model equation is this what we saw earlier. Y, I, J is the grand mean plus or minus, sorry, plus the group mean minus Y bar and then the observation minus Y, I. So again, you can see the Y bars cancel off and the yi's cancel off. This looks the same. So this grand mean term is found by averaging all the data. And there's the residual term. This is the observed value minus the group mean. Now, if h0 is correct, null hypothesis is correct, we're assuming all the means are the same, then all the means should be equal to the grand mean. And so this term here should be small. And in fact, the square should also be small as well. Now, it can be shown that if I just square everything, if I take this across to the left hand side, I would y i j minus y bar squared. And that's the total sum of squares. This is squares, sum of squares of each observation from the overall mean of the data. And I can write that in terms of what's called the factor or the factor or treatment sum of squares, which is essentially the group mean minus the grand mean. So this is how different the group mean is from the grand mean. And then this residual or the error term, which is the observation minus the group mean itself. So this is called the total sum of squares, the factor or treatment sum of squares, and the residual or error sum of squares. So this is something that can be shown fairly easily. Those interested can try it, and you can ask me afterwards. <coughs> 
So the treatment sum of squares measures the variation between the groups. So it tells you how different each group is from the grand mean. If H0 is true, they should all be very small. You can see that I weighted that by the uh, number of observations in each group. The residual sum of squares essentially measures the variation within the groups. So I'm taking a look at essentially several populations that could have different means. I'm looking at the variation over there and there and adding them all up. And so that's why you see this looks like yij minus the group mean. If I divide by ni, it should be ni, and here as well, ni minus 1, this becomes a variance of that group. So this is the same as the ni minus 1 si squared. This is, in fact, in some way the total variation in this for each of these groups added up. <coughs> and the total sum of squares is the overall sum of squares where it is the observation minus the grand mean squared. So as we said before, if H0 is true, then what you should find is that the variation between groups is small and the total variation is mainly by the variation within groups. So if H0 is true, this should be close to zero, and mainly these two are equal. Most of what you're seeing is just random variation. So what we do instead of just looking at <laughs> those things is we take a look at the ratio of the treatment sum of squares to the residual sum of squares. This should be small. But remember, the residual sum of squares is based on more observations. The treatment sum of squares is based on k observations, whereas the total is based on n, and so it wouldn't be fair just to compare those as they are. So what we do is, and I think I should make this residual. It's not actually n, but n minus k, as you'll see afterwards. So what we do is we actually divide each of these by the degree of freedom first, and we can set up the computations in the table that's called the ANIMA table. So we have the treatment and the residual and the total. The degrees of freedom total is always just one less than the number of observations. I have k treatments, so there'll be k minus one degrees of freedom, and this is by difference. So and that plus that should be equal to n minus one. Essentially, it's the number of observations minus the number of groups I've got. And I've got the total sum of squares on the bottom here, the treatment sum of squares, and the residual sum of squares. And the mean sum of squares are by dividing the sum of squares with a corresponding degree of freedom. So the mean sum of squares total is total sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom, k minus 1. And the same for the mean sum of squares residuals. And then the F ratio, this thing called the F ratio, is the ratio of the mean sum of squares treatment to the mean sum of squares residual. And that has this distribution. It's got two degrees of freedom. It's an F distribution. The first is the degrees of freedom for the numerator. And the second is the degrees of freedom for the denominator. And so they occur in the order in the table, top, first, and bottom, second. So that means I can find a p-value here and perform the test. But the p-value is actually found from something else other than the distributions we've seen before. So again, if the populations are truly different, what you'll find is that uh, the F ratio should be quite small. But if the treatments are very different, then the difference between the group means and the grand mean will be large and f will be large. So extreme positive values, because everything's positive here, these are all squares I'm looking at. Extreme positive values, large positive values, would be evidence against the null hypothesis. So I can find a p-value by looking at the f distribution with degrees of freedom k minus 1 n minus k, and I can do the hypothesis test in the usual way by comparing with some significance level. Here's an example. A milk company has four machines that fill two liter plastic containers with milk. In order to determine if the mean volume filled by these machines is the same, the quality control manager looks at 19 containers filled by the four machines, and here's the data. And so I'm trying to obtain the uh, information whether these machines fill different mean volumes. 
The summary states here, I've got each of the group means, I've got the group variances, and I've got the grand mean. You can see the number of observations here, n is 4, 6, 5, and 4, making 19 in total. So, how do we decide this question? Well, the first thing is, I look at some exploration of data. If I look at just simple scatter plots, what you'll find is that it looks like this is feeling a bit lower. These two don't seem to be different at all. This may be a little bit higher. But are the differences we are seeing here significant? And that's a problem. So I've just explained or I've just described what I'm seeing there. The machine one seems to feel the highest, two and four no apparent difference, and three is the least. Hypothesis here. So now hypothesis always say that all the means are the same. So I'm saying that mu1, mu2, mu3, and mu4 are all the same. And h1 says they aren't all the same, or simply h0 is false. If I use the formula we developed earlier and look at the total sum of squares, you can do the cal calculations. It comes to 0 0.007076. I'm keeping more decimals here because the numbers are quite small. The residual sum of squares is ni minus 1 si squared. I've got the variances there in my data, in my summaries, so I can use simply those. And so that comes to 00350. Now that's all I require to do because I don't actually have to find the total sum of squares. So there are four machines, and this is my n minus uh, k minus one. I've got 19 observations. This is my n minus one. That was my k minus one. I have found this, and I have found this, and this is by adding them up. So it's that one plus that one to give me the total sum of squares here, which I'm not requiring for the moment. You can add that yourself. And then the mean sum of squares for the machine is the sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom, and the same for the residual. And then the F ratio is just the ratio of these two things. So essentially this is going to be uh, this divide, that, that divided by that. 10.1. So I've got my number table set up fairly easily. Work through that carefully to make sure you understand it. So the P value will be F bigger than 10.1, where I've got F is an F 315, 3 and 15 distribution. And I can get that from R easily enough. The P value is quite small, it's less than 0 0.01, so the data provides sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. So that means that at the 1% level of significance, we conclude the mean volume filled by the machines are not all the same. So just on my explanation so far, I'm finding that machine 3 has the lowest, and that's what I'm saying. The question, of course, is can I determine the differences in some more formal way and some more accurate way? I know they're different, but exactly how are they different is the question I want to ask. As an example, exercise here, I've got a partially filled ANOVA table, and I've got some information given to you here. You should be able to work backwards to fill this in, and we'll do this in lectures ourselves.